Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Jakub Wondorowski. I work as a DevOps engineer at DivaE. And today I'd like to tell you a bit about WebAssembly uh, and why you should consider that as a language of your choice when moving things to the edge. So with web standards, uh, when you think about it, the, the only thing that comes to your mind immediately is HTML, JavaScript, and CSS. But the truth is that trio uh, have a new colleague, and that's WebAssembly. So you might, you might have missed the news, but it's out there. It, it's a real thing that is supported by every major browser these days. So WebAssembly is abbreviated as WASM. And whenever I say WASM or WebAssembly, that's essentially the same thing. But before we move on to the actual like, content, uh, let's, uh, let's put a bit of a caveat here. So I'll do my best to avoid the buzzword bingo. And I think that cartoon speaks for itself. But with any technology which is that new, it's super easy to fall into that trap. But as I said, I'll do my best to, to avoid it. So WebAssembly, what it really is. So by definition, WebAssembly is a binary instruction format for a conceptual machine. And that probably means nothing to you. And some of you may scratching your head as that's, that's not a super descriptive uh, information. But we'll get to that uh, in a second. I'll elaborate more uh, on the next slides. In practice, though, it is a compilation target for other languages. Uh, so essentially, you can take your existing code, let's say C, C++, Rust, Go, JavaScript, whatever, and compile that to a WebAssembly, a binary format that you can ship over the network and run in the browser. And as I said before, this is a real thing. This is a shipped product. So from seven, 2017, this is an official standard approved by World Wide Web Consortium. And I do believe that most of you, and I'm like, I'm 100% sure that every single one of you that watches this talk right now uses a browser that supports WebAssembly. The cool thing about WebAssembly, though, is that it's not a browser-specific thing. You can also run it outside of the browser. Uh, and that, that kind of boils down to WebAssembly name, which is sort of misleading. So it's, it's like, in practice, it's neither web nor assembly. Uh, but yeah, it is what it is. Uh, so how that uh, looks like in practice. So let's say you have your C++ code base, and you compile that to give an architecture, like x86 or ARM. But it would be kind of impractical if you'd like to compile your source code directly to give an architecture. So instead, what compiler does, it compiles that to a thing called intermediate representation. And that's the IR box in the middle. So that IR is like architecture agnostic representation of your code, then then can be mapped to individual architectures. And as I said before, WebAssembly is a conceptual virtual machine. And this is how it fits into that diagram. So your intermediate representation will be compiled to a binary, to a virtual machine um, that WebAssembly provides. And from that, uh, WebAssembly will figure out how to run that code on ARM architecture or x86 or whatever that is. So let's talk a, a bit about WASM features. So first of all, it is super simple. If you look at the WASM specification, you're going to figure out quickly that all it does is like essentially operations on numbers and memory. This is that simple. Uh, and that fact makes it super, makes the, the output super small and portable as like you don't have to target your code to, to, to a specific architecture. You're going to target that to something which is conceptual and generic. And that may bring you like JVM memories uh, to your mind, as the, the, the concept is kind of the same. Uh, it is also designed to be streamable. So the, the binary is structured in a way that you can like start processing it before it, it, it is fully downloaded, which is also a nice feature uh, when it comes to the, the last bullet point, which is fast and secure. So not only you can start processing it before you get the, the full binary in your browser, um, 
It is also fast because it follows the linear memory concept and it operates on those numbers and, and, and like performs some memory operations only. Um, and that, that, is, that also improves security and that can be easily sandboxed, uh, which is crucial if you'd like to run WebAssembly in an environment that you don't necessarily trust. So what do I mean by fast? So on the left-hand side, the y-axis presents time in microseconds, not milliseconds, but microseconds. And we have three instances here. The, the first one is a container. That needs around 150, 125 milliseconds to start, which doesn't sound like a lot. But if you think about a JavaScript function that you can execute on Google's V8 engine, that can go down to just five milliseconds. But that's still like, not, not, not a lot, but that can be reduced even further. So with Lucet, which is one of the WebAssembly runtimes, Fastly managed to get that number down to 35 microseconds, which is like insanely low number, orders of magnitude smaller than those previous instances. So, so far I've been telling you that WebAssembly is a, a binary format, but uh, there is a text representation of that binary called what WebAssembly text format. And here's a, a, a small sample how that actually looks like. So this is the a function. This is a function that adds two integers to each other, which you can figure out pretty quickly by looking at that code. But at the same time, this is not something that you'd like to use on your daily basis when writing code. Like you'd like to use your existing like higher level languages like Python, Go, Java, JavaScript, whatever, and just compile that to WebAssembly. That's primarily for debugging uh the binary of course you can translate that that what format back to the binary or binary to what format but it, again that's primarily for debugging purposes and this is a like if you're still not convinced this is a tweet from solomon hikes who's a co-creator of docker and in 2019 he tweeted that they wouldn't have needed to create docker if wasm and wasi existed in 2008 which is kind of a bold statement, uh, but also shows how important WebAssembly really is. And if you're wondering what WASI stands for, that's a WebAssembly system interface, uh, which is designed to be like a universal layer for WebAssembly to talk to external world. As previously, I said that it operates on memory and numbers. So if you'd like to issue a, a network request over the network, you can't really do it without some sort of middleware. And, and that WebAssembly system interface, WASI, uh, is meant to provide you that, that capability. And regardless of the environment you run your code, if that's a browser or like a server, that's going to work exactly the same way. OK, so WebAssembly in the wild. Mm, it, you've probably used that already without even realizing it's 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 using WebAssembly. So if you go to like earth.google.com uh, and you open up the developer console, you're gonna see that a binary, that wasn't binary is being downloaded to your browser and that is being executed. So you've been using, probably you've been using WebAssembly without even realizing. And the same applies to other tools. Like if you've worked with Figma, which is a tool for uh, collaborative design, for example, for web designs, um, you, you've used WebAssembly as well, or if you bought something online from an e-commerce site that happens to use Shopify, you've also used WebAssembly. Okay, so enough uh, about WebAssembly. That was a, like a 10 minute crash course on, uh, on WebAssembly. Uh, we're gonna focus on uh, WebAssembly beyond the browser. So what, what are we going to need to run, to run WebAssembly beyond the browser? First of all, we need a compiler. Uh, and sometimes it is uh, built into the language itself. For example, uh, Golang offers you a compilation flag that you can set and just compile your code directly to WebAssembly. Uh, for certain languages, for example, for C++, there's a 
special tool chain required called mscripting that can transform your existing C code to, to WebAssembly. And of course, you're gonna need a runtime as you can't just run that binary natively, you need some sort of a runtime. Your, your real browser is a runtime as well. But on the server side, you're gonna need something, some, some application that can consume uh, that WebAssembly binary. And there is a lot of them. So those three are probably the most popular ones. Uh, so the first one, Wasmer, is a is a essentially the whole ecosystem. So that offers you like a pluggable interfaces that uh, you can use to compile just a section or subsection of your application into Wasm and include that back to to the code base. Uh, there's a concept of packages through uh, web uh, WebAssembly Package Manager, WAPM. Uh, that Wasm, uh, Wasm time is like a reference implementation provided by, by Bytecode Alliance, which is a nonprofit organization uh, that gathers companies like Red Hat, Google, Fastly, and a bunch of others. Uh, and they like decided to uh, create that to like drive the, the WebAssembly development. And Lucet is uh, the, the runtime that Fastly uses to, to run uh, WebAssembly payload. Okay, so that was the server side. What about edge computing capabilities? As in that case, you don't really need a runtime. You're gonna rely on a service that has been provided to you by a third party. So what's currently available on the market? So Fastly has uh, the computed edge service, which allows you to run uh, WebAssembly binary, so you can essentially upload it uh, to them and they're gonna run that for you. Uh, of course, that, that would have to be distributed uh, by them across all the, all the servers they have. And a pretty similar concept applies to Cloudflare workers that you can also use to run WebAssembly modules. Uh, there are some provider independent uh, solutions like Wasm Edge Runtime, which is currently a sandbox project uh, at CNCF, Cloud Native Computing Foundation. Uh, and in like sort of indirect way, you can use uh, AWS Lambda at Edge as well to, to run your WebAssembly. Of course, you can't do that natively, so you can't just upload a binary uh, to, to AWS. You have to wrap it around in some JavaScript code or like in, in, in a Node.js boilerplate, but indirectly you can run uh, WebAssembly there as well. And of course, the, the list is not exhaustive. There are other providers that, that also allow you to run your uh, WebAssembly uh, binaries. But how does that really relate to AEM as a cloud service? So with, with introduction of, uh, of the cloud model, uh, it was a sort of a paradigm shift. So you no longer have access to the underlying JCR repository. You can't mess around with OSGI configs. You don't have access to the file system. Uh, it's more like a software as a service or, or platform as a service rather than if infrastructure as a service than that it used to be. Uh, but that also forces you to change the mindset, how you think about web, uh, how you think about AEM in the cloud. So to me, it's like no longer a central point of your platform. It is a part of it that provides you certain capabilities, certain features. It, it renders a content for you, but it's up to you. It's up to your architecture to decide if that content is has the, the final form or requires some further processing. And of course, with such change, that implies a set of challenges and opportunities. Uh, those challenges have been discussed before uh, throughout the day, so I'm going to focus on opportunities here. So here's a, a kind of a big picture uh, of your platform that or, or, or of a platform that composes out of several elements, including AEM as a, um, as a cloud service. Uh, so on the left-hand side, you see Fastly landscape and a bunch of smaller services inside. We're gonna do a deep dive into that in a second. On the right-hand side, you can see a bunch of services that we're gonna uh, communicate with and, and, the, and they are gonna provide some features for us. So for example, at the top, you have some identity provider that um, supports OAuth 2 protocol. You may have some APIs, for example, deployed in AWS. 
but doesn't have to be there. You can use like pretty much uh, any endpoint. Uh, in that blue box, you have uh, your AEM as a cloud service uh, endpoint, uh, and you've probably spotted that already. It also runs Fastly in front of it. So like we have like Fastly in front of Fastly, but like if we do a really uh, a deep dive into the whole plat platform, you may figure out that it's like Fastly in front of Fastly in front of Fastly in front of Fastly if you have like shielding and clustering enabled. So it get, can get pretty messy uh, over time. So like that, that's one of the reasons why I think about AEM as a cloud service as an endpoint that provides certain features. I don't really care whether that Fastly is there or not. It just offers me some resource that I consume. And last but not least, at the bottom, we have uh, our monitoring endpoint that we're also going to um, integrate with the entire platform. So let's zoom into uh, the Fastly box. And as you can see, we have five different services here. Uh, the one in the top left corner is the front door service, which is like the classic generic CDM configuration that's defined using VCL, which stands for Varnish Configuration Language. But also we have four WebAssembly services. Uh, the one uh, at the top on the right-hand side is the uh, auth service for authentication purposes. Uh, the one below is for handlebars, uh, handlebars template processing. The one below is for handling vanity URLs. And the one in the bottom left corner is to handle content security policy logging. We're going to explore those features one by one over the next slides. So let's let's have a look at the vanity URLs first. So there's a couple of approaches how you can tackle that. So the, 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 the most basic is, okay, let's just AM resolve them and, and handle, uh, handle the, the workflow. The second one is to use rewrite maps. And, and the final one is to use an external service to, to manage mm, the whole vanity URL landscape. So let's have a look at the example we have here. So first of all, uh, we need to make sure that every single vanity URL uh, that we're going to define at AEM, so on the right-hand side, will be accepted by the dispatcher. So you have to like figure out how to update the uh, dispatcher filter section dynamically. There is a built-in feature for that. So Periodically, the dispatcher is going to ask AM for the list of all the vanities, and that will uh, eventually become a part of the filter section in, in the dispatch config, so like a dynamic list of filters. Uh, and then when you receive a vanity URL request, uh, that's going to be proxied to AM. AM is going to use the resource resolver uh, to find the right uh, target for that vanity, and you're going to end up with a redirect, which is going to be propagated back to back to the user. Uh, if you need something more um, advanced, you may think about um, generating rewrite maps dynamically. So the flow starts uh, on the right-hand side at the top. You activate a page, which triggers invalidation request to your dispatcher. Then the dispatcher write, runs a handler, uh, which fetches the, the list of all the vanities in a form of a rewrite map, which is essentially a text file uh, that AEM produces. And like to keep things simple, it runs a JCR query, which then generates a simple rewrite map, which, as I said, is a text file with two columns separated by a space character. Uh, the file, go file goes back to the dispatcher. The dispatcher saves it into a file and stores it on disk. Uh, so Apache can use it later on while looking up the, the actual vanity. And, and of course, the, the invalidation uh, stops here. So dispatcher informs AM that it received the invalidation and, and did the, the work that AM asked for. Uh, so from user perspective, uh, if you request forward slash vanity2, it's going to reach the dispatcher. You have the, the, the vanity uh, um, rewrite map available. So you do the lookup and you just redirect. To, to the right location. And of course, if something uh, is being updated, so at the page level, you remove the, the vanity or add a new one. Uh, of course, the, the whole flow uh, happens again and you have the latest copy of your, all your vanities. And of course, that, that's not really possible with the world of AM as a cloud service, uh, just because you can't run that 
handler anymore. So before we go to the, the third solution to uh, vanity URLs, we can think about what else can be done to improve the overall experience. And you may think about like time limited redirects. So you start your campaign on Monday and the vanity should remain active only until Friday. So if you request the, the same vanity on Saturday, it should end with 404. So you, you can think about, okay, maybe I can deactivate the page, but if that vanity points to your homepage, that's certainly not a thing you'd like to do. Um, sometimes you'd like to keep those vanities geo-aware. So if you connect from Germany, you're gonna end up on a different URL, target URL than, from, for, uh, than someone who's connecting from US, for example. And, and sometimes um, those vanity URLs can be authentication um, or should be authentication aware. So for example, some of those vanities should work only for users that are already authenticated. So here's a, yet another diagram that outlines the, the flow and how you can use uh, the edge computing capabilities using WebAssembly and uh, a bit of logic from AEM to put all those things together. So the flow starts on the left-hand side, we request the vanity one uh, that reaches our front door service, which first of all enriches the, the request with some metadata. So we add information about the location of the client, so that's Germany. And it also checks if the user is already authenticated or not. It's not like presented here on the diagram, but as you can imagine, that should follow some uh, OAuth flow to make sure that the, the session is valid if the, the, the original request carried uh, a session. So once we have that, we pass the processing on to our vanity URL service, which then fetches the list of vanities from AM. So we have a server here that generates the JSON file, uh, which you can consume uh, in your WebAssembly module. And as you can see, it is no longer a simple two column file. You can put some structure uh, around it and say that, okay, for that vanity one, we have two distinct targets that vary by the user location. And we have some information about from which date to which date that vanity should remain active. So that our WebAssembly service will just parse it and do the lookup, issue a redirect that will go to uh, our front door service, and then it will be propagated to uh, to the user who requested that. And of course, some caching applies here. So you can like set the expire scatter, for example, to the value that uh, comes from the AM itself. And don't forget to set the vary header uh, as you definitely don't wanna cache uh, that uh, slash vanity as a redirect, permanent redirect to product one if you have some geologic in your uh, backend system. So. Subsequent requests will essentially stop at the front door service as it's been cached and, and like pre-generated for every subsequent request. Okay, so how does that actually look like from a development perspective? So there are, there are three commands that you should get familiar yourself with. So there is uh, that init, uh, which initializes the project, the, the WebAssembly uh, module. There is a build command, which uh, generates a binary uh, out of your source code. And there is a deployment command, uh, deploy command, uh, which pushes the code to uh, Fastly Cloud. And let's do a short of a demo uh, of that feature. So I generated um, a demo project here uh, which, run, uh, which runs Rust uh, as a language. Um, so here's the source code. Uh, it, it is like a sample um, project. Uh, so don't expect any uh, sophisticated features here, but essentially what it does, it just serves you uh, a piece of HTML uh, out of uh, the domain that you selected as a part of the configuration. So let's try to change something. And I have stashed the changes um, before. Uh, 
to like avoid editing that in place. Uh, so if I do get dev, you can see that uh, I removed head request support. Uh, so previously it accepted both get and head. Now it supports just get. So with that change, let me compile that uh, first. So let me run that fastly compute build. Uh, it is fairly quick. Uh, and that generates an archive file. So let's have a look at that. So we have uh, our binary here, which is that main that wasm file, and a bunch of metadata around it to like make it digestible by by Fastly Cloud. And once we have it, let's try to deploy it. So I'm going to run uh, a command uh, to deploy it, which is this. I also uh, I'd like to measure how long it's going to take. So I'm going to prepend time to this. And after that, I'm going to run a loop which will issue the head request, mind the capital I here, to that domain, which was generated automatically uh, every single second to see uh, how long it really takes to deploy the code and propagate the change. So from now on, head should not be uh, allowed. So before I deploy, let me actually um, let me show you that, that it accepts both head and get. So that's, uh, that's head request. And let me do it again for the head request. So the capital I and both return 200. So let me go back to our deployment command. So let me run it. And now we are just uploading that uh, archive file that I presented before. It should be fairly quick. In a couple of seconds, we should uh, get the information back that it's been successfully uploaded. And that's the case. It took like 13 seconds. And now every second I'm issuing a, uh, a request to the domain to see uh, when that's gonna stop working. I should get 405 status code back. Typically it was like a couple of seconds and there we go. We have 405 back. And so overall, it took us like 13 seconds to deploy the code and like 18 seconds to propagate that across the world, plus the compilation time. So like certainly less than a minute um, to do the entire deployment. And yeah, Cloud Manager, I look at you now. So yeah, let's move on to other features. Uh, content stitching. Uh, this is a quite popular uh, thing that uh, happens uh, at the edge. So when you think about content stitching at the edge, the first thing that comes to your mind is edge site includes. So this is like a super simple uh, include of a, of a snippet into your markup. So essentially an equivalent of server-side includes um, that you know from your Apache config. But quite often, this is not enough and you need something more robust. Uh, so there's a bunch of templating libraries that you can use. So handlebars is probably the most popular one, uh, which is uh, like used uh, all over the JavaScript ecosystem. But there are other options as well. So for example, the, the Terra language, uh, which is inspired by uh, the Jinja 2 templating engine, which is like originally from, from Python ecosystem. Uh, Liquid is uh, or was developed by, by Shopify folks and initially was written in Ruby, but was ported to other languages. So you can use that as well. Uh, and yeah, let's, uh, let's see how does that look in practice. So let's say we have our AM here and some API that provides us some dynamic information. Uh, so we request a product page uh, that reaches our front door service. Then the front door service calls our handlebar service to get the, both the, the, the template, the handlebars template, and the dynamic data, which lives somewhere. Uh, so in AM, we have a product generic HTML or AM essentially renders that product generic HTML file with a bunch of placeholders inside. 
Of course, you might have like different templates for different products, uh, but here let's keep it simple. We have a, a generic template that is being delivered by AEM. And then we have uh, an API which provides us a JSON file. Then we just essentially replace those. Of course, you can use like a loop here or an if statement or call additional ser service, etc. We just render the file and serve it over the network to, to the user. Of course, we can cache it. So subsequent requests will stop here at the front or service le uh, level. Uh, the next thing, the authentication at the edge. We're not going to do a deep dive here just because there's the, the flow is kind of complex. Uh, but you can visit this site to uh, get familiar yourself with uh, the actual flow. And there's a sample WebAssembly application provided that you can use to leverage WebAssembly capabilities uh, for authentication at the edge. So like at the very first level that your user Mm, sends requests to, you have that information whether that user is authenticated or not, which is or can be a deal breaker sometimes. And the last thing that I'd like to show you is the uh, content security uh, policy logging endpoint, uh, which is like an extremely popular situation uh, that happens in nearly every project that I was uh, involved in uh, before. So for those of you who are not familiar, uh, content security policy is a browser security feature, which essentially you as a, like a content provider instruct the browser via a special header what it can do and what it cannot. And, and I mean that, what I mean by that is that you can say that I only trust uh, fonts delivered from that domain, or I can only load CSS only if it comes from the same domain as the main site. Uh, and whenever there is a violation of that policy, the browser automatically issues a post request uh, with some sort of, with a payload, which is a JSON file, uh, that goes to the endpoint that you've specified uh, in your policy. Uh, so the, the purpose of that is to like aggregate all those violations so you can figure out what you should change with your policy or maybe you have a uh, some sort of a security problem in your application as, as someone managed to inject a piece of javascript into your html and all of a sudden some external domains are being requested even though that was not your intention so yeah yet another diagram um Let's say we have a violation on the site. Uh, so here you can see that uh, that URL was blocked. So this is a link to a CSS file uh, as the default policy does not allow it. And someone was on the sign up page and that CSS was requested. The policy does not allow it. And the policy is here. So default source none and report already is the URI is the, is the endpoint we're gonna send those violations to. So the browser essentially says, okay, I encountered uh, an attempt to uh, violate the policy. I'm going to inform you uh, for, via a post request that goes to this domain. And that domain can be your super simple WASM service that essentially transforms that payload into a log entry. And that log entry can be streamed to the platform of your choice. That can be like an S3 bucket your Elasticsearch, um, Kibana, Stack, or here um, to the, the Loki, Grafana Loki service, which is like for log aggregation as well. So with a, probably a couple of lines of code, uh, tops, you can achieve it uh, and, and have that logging capability uh, for free, essentially, as long as like Fastly is involved, of course. So what are the use cases for uh, that computed edge uh, feature? So first of all, content st stitching. So mm, you can use server-side rendering here as well. Uh, so if you use like React server-side rendering, that's perfectly possible to deploy that to the edge and render your content there. You can do all sorts of A-B testing. Um, you can do authentication as I presented before. Uh, you can apply some personalization. So if someone is authenticated, maybe it should, uh, the, the, the service should uh, expose more features. Uh, 
Uh, you can do like ads targeting and whatnot. And uh, the, the feature that uh, is kind of surprising, at least it was kind of surprising to me, that you can do games using edge assembly, uh, computed edge capabilities. And someone was like crazy enough to implement Doom using that service. So essentially what happens here is your browser sends the state of the game to that edge server and that edge server sends you the frame buffer back. So like every couple of milliseconds, there's like a tons of requests going on. You can Google the, the link to that. And the game is actually playable, but it is rendered at the edge using WebAssembly module. And it is like, it is kind of funny that they've managed to do it like without any major change in the original Doom code base. So like 90% of the code base is exactly the same. They've compiled that C code to WebAssembly and just uploaded that to, to Fastly. And all of a sudden they have a Doom running uh, on WebAssembly uh, at the edge. Okay, so what is the state of WebAssembly? Um, uh, so at the moment, uh, Fastly supports three languages. So Rust is probably the most uh, reliable uh, and, and robust ecosystem when it comes to WebAssembly. Uh, it is currently in limited availability, but what it really means is that you have to uh, request access to it and you're gonna get it. That, that's, that's what it stands for. Uh, there is also a support for web uh, for assembly script and JavaScript. Uh, assembly script is uh, like a strongly typed TypeScript, uh, and JavaScript was added like around a month ago. So it's probably not the most reliable uh, service now, but it's getting better over time. Uh, and I've seen demos of like server side rendering using that JavaScript WebAssembly uh feature so it certainly works uh what are the constraints though as like it's not always like um it's not all about the all the good things so there are some constraints uh so right now you can do 32 backend requests and that number uh, was increased um over time like i believe initially it was like four or eight requests so um, that changed over time. The maximum size of your binary is 50 megabytes. Uh, and you can do your processing for two minutes. However, that two, minute, two minutes uh, includes like wait time as well. So you have like 50 milliseconds of your of CPU time within that two minutes. But if you wait for a response from an endpoint, that doesn't really count as CPU time. And of course, there are some memory limits as well. So as you can see, uh, there's a lot of options that you can use uh, to consume various endpoints and stitch them together uh, at the edge. Uh, and yeah, that's essentially all I had. Let me go to the Q&A section uh, and have a look what we have here. Um, um okay so answer now so we have a first question uh what uh, wasm seems to run faster than most minimal billable increments in compute hosting providers uh aws lambda charges at minimum 100 milliseconds what approach would you recommend to run wasm at scale as compute on demands taking cost perspective into account so this is something that you would have to um, calculate on your own as like the, the answer is of course it depends like if you have on one hand on one hand side let's say if you have a quite complex and quite large kubernetes cluster that you have to maintain and scale uh, which provides a feature that can be easily backported to a web assembly module that can be deployed to uh, to the edge and like you can achieve exactly the same functionality without that overhead of managing extra infrastructure, then it's probably a good move. Uh, but at the same time, if that's gonna cost you more, uh, and I, by more, I mean like an order of magnitudes more, that's something you would have to consider. There's a, I can link to a great blog post uh, that compares that uh, the 
uh, Lambda, AWS Lambda to like free servers that they run uh, on-prem or somewhere in AWS. And the, the, the cost difference was like $1,600 uh, a month versus like 150. So you would have to just, you know, do the math and, and figure out uh, what, what is the best solution. As there is no silver bullet. There's no such a thing. The answer is always, it depends. Uh, okay, we have yet another question. So let me bring it up. Are there any pitfalls when using chained Fastly setups? I assume in Fastly 1, Fastly 2 backend, both Fastly 1 and Fastly 2 run uh, correctly in the same region, Australia, Australia backend. Um, there's, a, there's, a, there's a chance that there will be issues as um, with that Fastly in front of AM as a cloud, you don't have like match access to that and you have to rely on like DTLs. So like you can imagine that you're gonna like get stale content or you have to keep those DTLs extremely low. And if you add the, the shielding um, to the equation, then uh, it gets even more complex. Uh, so I'm gonna talk about shielding in the context of um, asset optimization on Wednesday. Uh, so like every time you put a CDN in front of another CDN, it's almost certain that you're gonna face some issues. Uh, but as you said, uh, like if you're in Australia and uh, you hit the, the Australia uh, edge server first uh, as an entry point to your application in like, 99% of cases, the, the, the second Fastly will be based in Australia as well. The server uh, of the second Fastly will be in Australia as well, as it, it would be pointless to go through like US from the, uh, but as I said, if you have shielding in place, that changes a few things, but more on that on Wednesday. Okay, uh, I think that's it. There's no more questions. So thank you everyone, uh, enjoy the rest of the conference.